Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Tavener and I am your host of Any Further Questions. Welcome to episode 7 of series 2. Joining me today is Professor Maggie Snowling. Maggie is a developmental psychologist specialising in language difficulties such as the topic of today's conversation, dyslexia. She is currently an emeritus professor in psychology at the University of Oxford, but has held many other eminent academic positions in her career. She was awarded a CBE in 2016 for her services to dyslexia and has countless awards and recognition for her work on today's topic, so it's safe to say Maggie is probably one of the best people to speak on this subject. On the 8th of February, Maggie gave a Gresham lecture with the title Dyslexia and Language, Disorder or Difference? If you haven't already, you can watch the lecture on our YouTube channel, which I strongly recommend you do before listening to the podcast. All episodes of Any Further Questions are available to listen to on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so please do go and check them out now. Maggie, welcome. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for sitting down with me. It's a pleasure. As you can probably imagine, we were yet again inundated with questions following your lecture, so thank you everyone for sending them in. So for the benefit of our listeners and for a bit of context, I'm going to start by asking you to very simply define dyslexia. Well, dyslexia, put most simply, is a difficulty in acquiring reading and writing fluency. More formally, we describe it as a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it's a difficulty which is Uh, observed very early in development, it's likely to have a genetic basis. We had a few questions about dyslexia being more common in boys than in girls. Some people with personal experience and some people have read it. Is dyslexia more common with boys? I think dyslexia is more common in boys, though the actual data on the uh, sex ratio is, is rather variable. So just from a um, perspective of sort of history, um, I guess the first um, description of uh, dyslexia as a specific learning difficulty was um, made in the Isle of Wight studies by uh, Professor Sir Michael Rutter and and his colleague, um, Professor William Yule. And they looked at all of the 9 and 10 year olds um, living at the time in the Isle of Wight, which was in the 60s, and they looked at those with specific reading difficulties and they found that about three boys to every girl were affected. And there have been quite a lot of population studies um, suggesting that uh, ratio. However, um, there are other studies which question that it is quite so extreme, think a bit more like one and a half boys to every girl. Um, Certainly if you look at referral rates, more boys get referred for dyslexia, but this might be because as a, re- as a reaction to being dyslexic, boys tend to have more behaviour problems which are very noticeable, whereas girls tend to, what we say, internalise more. They tend to get more anxious and quiet and possibly a little bit depressed. So, uh, yeah, I think it is true that boys are more vulnerable to dyslexia, um, but it's probably not as big a ratio as people think. Would would you say it has anything to do with genetics or is it more to do with what you just mentioned about the behaviour being more noticeable? No, I think there definitely is a genetic basis uh, to dyslexia. The, probably the very best evidence we have is that we know that it runs in families. Um, so if you are a dyslexic parent, uh, each of your obst- offspring has about a 25 to 50% chance of being dyslexic themselves. Um, So that's um, an indication of its heritability. That doesn't mean it's necessarily genetic, of course, because genes act through the environment and families share the environment as well as sharing their genes. But um, nevertheless, molecular geneticists have been searching for genes associated with dyslexia now for some uh, really probably... 30 or 40 years and the way in which the field is now going um, now that there are lots of gene technologies is that um, it's been discovered that there are numerous uh, gene variations uh, that are associated with dyslexia in in one of the latest papers some 42 um, small bits of the genes that seem to be associated with different aspects um, of dyslexia the complexity here though is that some of those many genes also code for other difficulties, for example, language disorders or attention disorders. And this might be why we quite often see that dyslexia co-occurs with other difficulties. 
a lot of the questions we had sent in mentioned the acronym DLD, Developmental Language Disorder. Could you just talk a bit about what that is? Is that a catch-all term? So uh, DLD or Developmental Language Disorder is a very uh, significant disorder in terms of its um, impact. It's probably similar to that of um, Autism Spectrum Disorder, but it is relatively little known. So this is a disorder that affects the acquisition of spoken language as opposed to dyslexia, which primarily affects the uh, acquisition of a written language. Um, so children with uh, language disorder often are very late talkers. By the time they are two, whereas most kids have around 50 words, they probably are not speaking at all. Um, they have difficulties in language comprehension, so many might think that they perhaps have got a hearing impairment, but that's not the case. And when they go to school, they may not be speaking in sentences. So it is actually a very serious disorder. Um, in its milder versions, or in it, well, in all of its versions, it's a very um, significant risk factor for dyslexia. So someone with even a mild version of DLD, if they go to school still with poor language, they're going to be at high risk of having reading problems. And how would you go about identifying this language difficulty in a child specifically? Well, identifying a language disorder um, is usually the domain of speech and language therapists. But um, so um, when uh, parents are concerned about their child's language development, I guess the first thing they do would go to their GP and the first thing would, that normally would be explored would be their hearing. They may eventually find themselves um, to see a speech language therapist. But in the very early years, um, up until about age three or four, there's a lot of variability between children in language. So some children are what we call late talkers. They simply talk late, uh, but then they catch up. So it's quite difficult in the very early stages of development to know for sure whether someone has a developmental language disorder. If, however, that um, difficulty is still manifest at four and a half and five when the child goes to school, it's very likely that they do have a language disorder. And at that point, um, well, from around age four, so on, uh, there are various language screening tools that can be used to identify um, the, the level of spoken language acquisition that a child has and therefore whether or not they need um, some form of treatment or intervention. Apart from a family history of dyslexia, are there developmental differences which might indicate a likelihood of dyslexia, such as not crawling, starting to walk without crawling first, which show a higher risk? So it's often been um, said that uh, there are delayed mo what we call motor milestones. This comes back to the 1960s when uh, neurologists were the profession primarily uh, interested in um, dyslexia. But I think there's no strong evidence at all that that is a risk factor for dyslexia. It probably is a risk factor for developmental coordination disorder, sometimes referred to as dyspraxia. And of course, we know that dyslexia often co-occurs. So I think if a child has shown significant difficulty with the development of motor coordination, then it's likely they have a, a, a coordination or a dyspraxic disorder rather than dyslexia per se. We had a number of questions that addressed language. We had one that said, what about in different cultures or languages? Is dyslexia more common in English than French, for instance? And does dyslexia manifest in different ways in different languages? It's definitely the case that dyslexia manifests differently in different languages. Um, and that's because different writing systems have different ways of connecting print with sound. Um, so I need to say a little bit more about what learning to read um, requires and learning to spell being the reciprocal process. So this requires the child to develop mappings between the speech of, a, of your speech and, and print. And in English, that's at the level of very small speech sounds called phonemes and they're linked to letters or graphemes. So they're very fine grained connections which are really quite um, difficult for the, the brain to um, establish in, in, early on. And um, learning to read is difficult for a child because although they um, 
can often see the letters of the word, they, they, they don't actually understand that spoken words can be split into these little phonemes. They, they think that, you know, a, um, a cat is, uh, is a furry creature. They don't think of it as a cat. And they have to be able to access those phonemes to develop the, the reading system. In actual fact, because English is an irregular orthography, so those mappings don't always work. So if you have a word like school and you start saying s, k, h, u, o, you, you won't get to school. Because the mappings are difficult to set up, English is arguably the, one of the most difficult languages to learn. Now, in other um, languages, um, there's a whole kind of spectrum of differences in uh, writing systems. But I think at, at another extreme is the Chinese language or, or, or let's say Japanese. Japanese is very, um, has two writing systems within it. It has um, a sort of more of an alphabetic system like our system, except their system maps between syllables, uh, the beats of a word and, um, and some of the uh, characters. But they also have uh, a system called uh, kanji, which is based on the Chinese writing system, whereby the complex characters that have to be mapped often to meanings or to whole words. So children learning Japanese have a terrific challenge because they have the challenge that um, English children have. And they also have a challenge of learning many, many, many different characters and the words that they um, link to. So you can see the demands of learning to read differ a lot between uh, different cultures and therefore um, the manifestations of dyslexia is different. And in a very succinct way, learning to read in English, children have difficulty in establishing what we say, cracking the code, and they have lots of problems with reading accuracy. If you go to a European language like Finnish or, or, or Spanish, which is quite regular in its letter sound correspondences, children learn to decode, to read words very quickly, but the rate at which they do that is very slow. So in those languages, dyslexia is picked up by a slowness in reading, not by differences in reading accuracy. Um, and in the, in the uh, more complex orthographies, in addition to all of those language-based problems a child might face, they also can face visual perceptual difficulties, can, can affect them, because the characters they learn are so complicated from a visual point of view. So the manifestation differs across languages, but at the core is this language learning difficulty. Please do go and watch the lecture, because you do mention... You have a question about Chinese specifically, and I remember you um, covering that in the question and answer session uh, for the lecture. We had a question about the history of dyslexia. Has any mention of dyslexia been found in historical records pre-1800? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, so the first uh, identified cases of dyslexia were actually in Germany in the 1880s, and we have no record before that. But that's for a very particular reason, which is that literacy wasn't very widespread um, in the 19th century. It was only the most highly educated people who would have been uh, literate. So really, um, the identification of dyslexia and awareness of it really only got going when there was more uh, widespread um, education and uh, hence the teaching of reading. So we, we know relatively little about its early foundations. We know that in, in Britain, um, there was um, quite a lot of interest in dyslexia in the early part of the 20th century, primarily by ophthalmologists, because people thought then it was something to do with the eyes. Um, but um, as the uh, century progressed, this language or verbal learning difficulty became a more prominent feature and it sort of changed uh, how we thought about dyslexia. But no, it absolutely depends upon um, children being brought up in a literate culture, obviously. And it's probably still some communities in the world where, um, where literacy isn't really valued and therefore having a reading problem is perhaps never even noticed. What are some common misconceptions of, or myths surrounding dyslexia and how can we address them through education and awareness? Well, there are quite a lot of what sometimes referred to as neuro myths about dyslexia. Uh, the first is that people think people with dyslexia have brain damage. Um, 
you can get acquired dyslexia after um, a stroke or, or other brain uh, lesion, but um, there's no evidence it's to do with brain damage. It may be to do with differences in the development of um, uh, brain structures, but we still know relatively little about this. We are It is uh, an active area of research. Um, another myth is that it's to do with the eyes, eye tracking. Well, eye tracking, um, if you look at uh, uh, the eye movements of someone with dyslexia, they will they may look very erratic, but that's not because they've got erratic eyes. It's because they're not reading in the way which we do, where we use regular eye movements to um, scan across the page. Um, another um, idea is that um, it's due to visual stress. So visual stress is a condition uh, whereby when there is a lot of um, uh, uh, sort of visual displays, particularly contrast between black and white, um, the uh, individual is um, prone to um, to really to stress, um, and headaches are common, um, and um, that these um, individuals often can benefit from having some kind of coloured filter or lens. Uh, there is a common misconception that this is a causal factor in dyslexia, but it absolutely is not. And therefore, it is certainly not a cure for dyslexia. Um, of course, some people with dyslexia will also have visual stress. And I understand, though I'm not sure of the research here, that that's particularly common in people who have migraine in the family. Um, so that's just some of the myths. There are others, but I could go on <laughs> probably for the rest of the podcast. That's fine. <laughs> um Gresham College is all about public speaking and we invite speakers and professors from all over the world um, and all ranges of academia to come and give lectures. And we had one question that relates to that. Could learning rhetoric or public speaking help someone with dyslexia, in your opinion? Well, that's a question. It's a kind of an empirical question and no one's done the trial and it would be very interesting to do that trial. Um, so... I think one of the things about public speaking is that initially everybody says, oh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> it's really about confidence and, and, and projecting yourself. And I think most people can learn that. No matter how introverted or how shy they are, they can learn a different role and they can learn public speaking. So I think this could be very beneficial to people with dyslexia because it, it's one of the many things that can actually help their self-confidence and self-esteem. And that typically will get knocked if you have had a, um, a lot of failure in school. So I don't know if it can help dyslexia per se, but I certainly think um, it can increase confidence. And of course, some of our uh, well-known um, celebrity actors um, are dyslexic and, and one of the first... Um, uh, pioneers, really, uh, who was very prominent in the dyslexia field was Susan Hampshire. Um, many listeners won't remember Susan um, uh, in her days of acting, but um, she is severely dyslexic. And, you know, I, I, I know that for, for sure. Um, she was supported very much in learning um, by her mother, who set up a little school but actually, even learning scripts, it's a question of improvising, but also confidently speaking. So um, I don't think it's a cure, but I certainly think it can be a helpful um, strategy for, for, for you know, uh, protecting the strengths of people with, with dyslexia. We had a number of questions about research into dyslexia, and I wanted to ask you in two ways. Firstly, from the government's perspective, what the government could be doing more, in your opinion, and secondly, what the scientific community could be doing more. Are there any new areas of research that they could be exploring further? Um, so firstly, for the government, it, in your opinion, what could the government do to help dyslexia research? OK, well, I, I think... Um I think our knowledge of dyslexia is really well developed and sufficient now to really um, influence policy. Um, I think 
And, and, and if you go back to 2009, there was an independently commissioned government report by uh, Sir Jim Rose um, on uh, ways of um, assessing and teaching children with dyslexia and other learning difficulties. And, and in a way, everything that was said in that report, in my view, still stands. Um, initially, it was implemented with a big boost to funding to train specialist dyslexia teachers and um, a, a, you know, a cohort of teachers with specialised skills were um, trained. And, um, and this is a very important um, strategy because if every school had a trained dyslexia specialist, they would have absolutely the homegrown person who could one, identify and two, support and three, manage the issues around dyslexia. Unfortunately, that um, funding was pulled, um, and um, so there's the, sp the only specialist training that exists now is, um, you know, it's, it's done by independent organisations who do a great job. The British Dyslexia Association, uh, Dyslexia Action, but but you know they're not they're not free of charge to um, our state school teachers. Um, the second thing is that we know. Um, a lot about the risk factors for dyslexia and we've spoken about language. If a child goes to school with poor oral language, they're going to be at high risk of dyslexia. We really need to get language screening into schools at school entry um, and we need to be picking up children who need language intervention as a foundation for learning to read. So that's the second plank I would say that should be there in the strategy. The third thing is of course reading screening. Now, a lot of people don't like screening, you know, it's just more um, high stakes testing. And, but actually, we've got a screener in our system at the moment, and it's called the Phonics Screening Check, and it's done the, at the end of year one. And it consists of asking children individually to read um, a set of words and a set of non-words. Now, the thing about non-words is they're really hard to decode, and children with dyslexia have particular difficulty with them. However, if you don't reach the sort of age appropriate uh, stage on the um, screening check, um, the school is meant to put in some kind of support. But I don't think we really have very good pathways there. And I don't think, um, you know, there's the, the funding's not there. And I don't think it's really mandated. So, um, so there's a sense in which we are screening, but actually a lot of that information is then disappearing and children then go on and on through the system. Um, and, and of course, as they go on, the gap between them and their peers widens. So it's probably quite important to have another screener before transition to secondary. And I don't mean in year six, because that's too late, but in year five, say, which could be a fairly quick spelling test. And again, pick up children who are having significant difficulty. All of these are points along the way where governments could actually have a policy. Um, I think the reading frameworks, which are, um, uh, you know, the guidance in the reading frameworks that are, are government led, are very, very good for most children, but not necessarily for children who really have significant difficulty. In your opinion, what could the scientific community be doing more in this area? Well, as I've said, the uh, understanding of dyslexia as a learning disorder is well understood, and there is there is active research going on in in in, in neuroscience in relation to dyslexia. But the best chance of interventions currently, uh, and even identification, is at the cognitive level. So I think we need to be thinking about studies that look at cognitive processes in dyslexia, and and then using them to build theoretically motivated interventions. So I so so I think we'll, what we what we need to understand more is the cognitive underpinning so that that will place us in a good position to develop um, theoretically and trial and evaluate um, interventions. I think that uh, it's really academic leads that are needed to run randomized trials, they're complicated methodologies and um, more um, Early career researchers should be encouraged to put their toe in the water. I think many uh, academics stay at the um, more theoretical level and they think 
the other bits are a bit kind of messy and, and problematic. And, and it is undoubtedly the case that they are hard to do, but they are incredibly um, important. In terms of scientific questions, I think our questions now really pretty much focus in on the fact that dyslexia co-occurs with other difficulties. So we know that phonological or speech processing difficulties are at the core of um, of dyslexia. Um, we know that in um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder at the core are problems with um, what we call executive function, the control and manipulation of attention. When you get these two things together, does that mean um, that they interact in some way? Does it mean the impact is greater? Um, do they, um, uh, are, the, are these um, different risk factors really um, specific to each disorder? Or is there some sharing? And if you take the example of dyslexia and I'm going to call it dyscalculia, maths disorder, some proportion, about 50% of children with dyslexia will also have problems with maths and about 50% won't. So where you get that co-occurrence, what factors are shared between the two disorders? One factor that is definitely shared is language. And children with language disorder have terrible problems with both reading and with maths because the the foundation of maths is arithmetic, which is a verbal um, system. But the two disorders also have more uh, specific factors. So um, in the uh, domain of, um, of, of maths, there are um, nonverbal systems that deal with numerosity that are impaired, which are not impaired in dyslexia. And similarly, phoneme awareness is impaired in dyslexia. It's not impaired in uh, dyscalculia. So, so I think that's where the, um, the activity could now be. And it would help with identification or, um, because often people get the wrong diagnosis, um, as you can imagine. So, I mean, for many years... I used to believe that the behavioural problems um, with uh, that were associated with dyslexia were just a consequence of children, you know, not being able to concentrate. And I used to think the reason some kids were anxious was because, you know, they you know they, they weren't confident because they couldn't read. But actually, there's quite a lot of evidence that the children with dyslexia who develop anxiety have got some underlying disposition to an anxiety disorder where and similarly uh, children who have um, perhaps more complicated conduct disorders or, or um, offending behaviours, they probably have something, not just dyslexia. So I think that area of comorbidity or co-occurrence is quite important. We had a question they were asking about specifically state schools and whether in your opinion more needs to be done in state schools, schools where the funding is not necessarily there? Well, I mean, you put your finger on it there. <laughs> um, I guess most state schools are really keen to do something, but there isn't the resource. Um, in a way, the most cost-effective way of intervening is by um, training and uh, supporting um, a teaching assistant. Um, so... Um, you know, we've developed um, language interventions for delivery by teaching assistants uh, in recent years, which um, have been uh, rolled out by government. But um, going back um, in some, you know, into the into the early twenty um, first century, we were also publishing a lot of um, randomised trials showing the efficacy of teaching assistants in in delivering reading interventions. And so, um, you know. If state schools were given more, um, you know, kind of ring fence budgets for using teaching assistance in this way rather than in other ways, um, but I, what I don't want to do is, is shrink the amount of funding going to schools. Um, but I think there isn't enough funding to deliver um, really what these children need. And, and, and then what happens? First of all, I mean, the mainstream teacher can't do it because they've got a, a whole class to look after. Um, what happens if there's nothing available is the, um, the children who are advantaged have parents who take them off for private tuition and they fill the gaps. And that just leaves another cohort, you know, another group of children often who are disadvantaged in many ways, who are really, really slipping through this net. So um, there does need to be an overview 
of children's language and reading needs before they go to secondary school. Yeah. Presumably, I was going to say, it, it's a treatable condition that can be done, but it, you need money to do that. And the children who are falling through the net are the ones that don't have that disposable income. Exactly. What does Professor Snowling think about the connection to music learning? I don't really know the answer to this question. I am very unmusical myself. Um, And um, I don't think dyslexia is 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 an issue for people learning music. Um, But it hasn't really been properly researched. Um, So some people do say that learning the mappings between the... um, the, the notes on the stave and the actual, say, finger movements and so on, it, it creates a difficulty. Uh, there's also a view that it's particularly difficult if you're um, trying to learn an, uh, an instrument like the piano, which has different, you know, different uh, movements for each hand. But it's an area where um, there really isn't much research and even what there is, I can't say I'm very familiar with. You mentioned executive functioning disorder, which segues beautifully into my next question. I was going to ask about the relationship that dyslexia has with other difficulties. Um, You mentioned one um, about maths. Dyspraxia as well um, is another. We had a question. One other aspect of dyslexia is the issue of organisation or disorganisation called executive functioning disorder. Is dyslexia only word blindness or does it cover this? I think you... This is a complicated question and the reason is executive function is a complex term that covers a lot of different processes. We even talk about hot and cold executive function. So the cold is things like controlling your attention, inhibiting your responses. The hot is more emotion regulation. So, So already we're talking about different aspects of executive function. And when people talk, so, so when people talk about organizational difficulties in dyslexia it's probable that they have some problems with um, planning and organization they don't always often fulfill criteria for ADHD but um, because these disorders are dimensions you can be dyslexic and have a bit of another dimension so it's possible that there are some aspects of executive function to do with planning and organization that particularly that, that affects some children with dyslexia, but not all. I've worked with dyslexic students who are entirely obsessional and complete perfectionists in terms of their organisation. It's definitely not always there. And I think to some extent it can be there because it is a, I do think it's a consequence. You know, if, if, when every other child is learning to, you know, write in their ho- uh, homework book and put all their um, the, the required books in the bag... A dyslexic child is still trying to listen to what the teacher said to write it down and so they shove everything into the bag. So there's a kind of sense in which some of it's probably secondary. Um, so, I, 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 so I think that is uh, is important. The other aspect um, that I would want to mention, though, is that um, children with language disorder have very significant difficulties with executive function. And so to the extent to which dyslexia is associated with a language disorder, you you will find that there are executive deficits. Your talk focused a lot on children and children learning to read. And we had a question about once the child has been identified with a language disorder or dyslexia when they're young, Mm -hmm. it may be addressed and then they may grow up and they may learn to read, but learn to read slowly and learn to write but learn to write slowly are there any ongoing tools being researched to help those past the age of formal education um i don't know of this research but i think there is certainly a great deal of interest in the use of assistive technology educational technology um with um adults and and children too and actually my own view is that we should have um experts who can visit schools to actually help children with persistent dyslexia to use some of these tools. Um, Reading pens, voice recognition software, um, and so on. Um, With regard to adults, um, again, there seem to be um, two sorts of adults there are are, (laughs) with dyslexia. There are adults who are very comfortable about self-reporting their dyslexia. Um, and 
and by the way, I think that's very important because if you don't, you can really get into trouble at work and, and you know, and then, of course, it's too late to say, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm dyslexic. Um, I think because I think employers are, have a duty to um, make special arrangements for people who, 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 are, who are dyslexic. Um, but for those who are uncomfortable with self-report because they think this might involve some stereotyping or prejudice against them, um, they seem to really resist technology. So even though you can now, you know, dictate your emails, um, you can, um, uh, you, you know, you can um, ask people, do you mind if I just record your meeting? Can I record you on our Zoom call? Some people won't do that because they're, they're kind of ashamed. And I don't, I think they need to get, be encouraged to be just completely honest and be themselves. Um, we need, as, as people um, in our society, we need to be accepting of difference. Um, and then there are the other kind. <laughs> and often I've seen this in um, students in a, at universities who've had a, um, a diagnosis during childhood who are just supremely well kitted. Um, I mean, I marvel do it using Excel sheets with voice recognition software, do it using statistical software, just talking to a machine. I mean, I just can't imagine doing it. Um, so there's a lot that can be done. You have to be patient. Um, so if you're trying to use voice recognition software, you obviously have to, you know, put up with the mistakes it makes until it learns your own voice. And I suppose the big question is about chat GPT. <laughs> and I guess the hazard here for dyslexics is their proofreading skills. That was my, <laughs> that was going to be my final question of the podcast, but we can address it now. How can AI help people with dyslexia? So if we're looking far into the future, what could AI do? Well, I think, I think AI will be able to do a lot, um, but I do think that um, it's a hostage to fortune. And um, if people are going to use this effectively, they're going to have to have some support and training in how to use it. Um, even if you just go back to the old spell checkers, this used to be a bit of a nightmare for people with dyslexia because they'd substitute one word for another word, which is even further away from their spelling error. So people didn't know what the heck they were talking about. So you can imagine um, Ch Chat GPT um, you know, putting out a report um, or, or um, you know, an essay if you're in education and there being quite a lot of mistakes that you as a dyslexic person don't notice because you read it in a certain way that doesn't really identify the errors. So I think I think there is a lot uh, in the future, but also looking far into the future, we can learn from the past. I mean, in the past, when literacy wasn't widespread, there was no such thing as dyslexia. And if AI eventually does take over the need to read and write, then actually there will be no dyslexia. <laughs> um, I've got I've got a few more questions, but there was one question which I wanted to ask you about. Do you understand the acronym N E L I? We had a question. Nelly, I'll, yes. I'll read it. That's our Nelly. <laughs> okay. I have a friend whose father had dyslexia until at seventeen years old in the nineteen seventies. He had an ep epileptic fit. When after treatment with drugs, he was magically cured. Stories like this might be rare, but they may also show that dyslexia is such a broad spectrum with so many causes, including societal. So how can one program like NELI, Nelly, work for the more severe cases with multiple causes? Okay, well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? So for any intervention... Um, Could you first say, sorry, what, what is sorry. NELI? <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, first of all, Nelly is the Nuffield Early Language Intervention. Nelly is its acronym. It's a 20-week um, oral language intervention, uh, which is delivered... Um, by trained teaching assistants um, in um, usually in the first year of school. Um, it involves um, work to um, enrich vocabulary development, uh, improve what we call narrative skills, so speaking, and also listening and understanding um, of language. It's, um, it's a combined one-to-one -one and small group program. And it's been shown in several um, randomized trials to be um, effective in improving children's oral language. And um, so in relation to dyslexia, we would expect having a better oral language foundation will in turn improve their um, 
reading development and the skills they have for reading. And in fact, in our um, last trial, uh, it was which was done by an independent group of evaluators, there was a sig- small but significant effect of uh, the Nelly program on early reading. That's only in year one, though. You still need to build um, build upon that. So in any intervention like Nelly, like reading interventions, um, we have a concept called response to intervention, RTI. And some people say that response to intervention itself is an important marker of dyslexia. So if you respond really well to an intervention for reading, um, you might have a fairly mild form of dyslexia. But if you have a severe form, your your um, your response will be you know, less good. Um, And so, yes, we would expect some children um, will have more severe difficulties. So at the end of um, the Nelly intervention, they will still have lingering uh, language problems. When that happens, what we recommend is that that child is then um, referred to a speech and language therapist for more specialised one-to-one work. Um, And um, you can say a similar thing about a reading intervention. In fact, we did this. One of the reasons we started to work on language intervention was um, in about 2006, we were working on reading intervention and we we looked at um, children who showed poor response to reading intervention. And guess who they were? They were children who had poor language. And that's why we started to think that language um, enrichment was an important tool in the kit of people wanting to help uh, children with um, dyslexia. So... um, But with a reading intervention, um, assuming the child doesn't have a language problem, but they're severely dyslexic, um, at the end of an intervention, I think it's really then befalls to um, professionals to ask, could there be anything else going on? That is, is dyslexia associated with some other kind of disorder? Maybe that child has attention disorder and needs some help with their um, attention control in order to benefit. Maybe that child's having some uh, emotional difficulties. Maybe that child actually just isn't motivated. So you need to sort of, before you just do more of the same, you need to have a careful assessment of what el- what else might be um, making progress slow. And it might just be that they need another like, dose of the intervention. That was all the questions we had today. If someone listening to this feels like their child might have dyslexia or they themselves might have dyslexia, where could they go online or in person in order to address their dyslexia? Well, I think the first thing that that they can do is to look to see whether locally there's any form of dyslexia association because these parent groups can be very supportive. And they're all kind of under the umbrella of the British Dyslexia Association, which has a helpline. Um, And um, the people answering that helpline will be in a very good position to um, advise. Similarly, if it's a language difficulty, um, again, um, there is an organisation called um, uh, Raising Awareness of Developmental Language Disorder. So the acronym is R-A-D-L-D. There's an excellent um, website and also um, there is a helpline with the organisation Aphasic, A-F-A-S-I-C. So helplines are a good um, way for parents to get some support. And often they need just a little bit of someone to talk to. Um, But the person they should be going to initially, of course, is their teacher in the hope that their teacher will um, uh, then advise Um, usually um, with some extra um, help, then possibly in what we call a catch-up class, which would be a small group getting some extra literacy support, and then if not, some kind of pull-out program where they're getting more individualised support. And in the the best resource settings, that's what would happen. You first of all have, you know, you have your teaching in the mainstream, then you go into something called Tier 2, which is probably some small group catch-up support, and then you go to Tier 3, which is more specialist support. And then after Tier 3, you really start thinking about having some kind of statement for special educational needs. Um, if the teacher doesn't um, come up with the goods, obviously there's the head, um, the special needs coordinator, there's also the governors. So I, I think that... 
And it's really important not to get into any kind of conflict, but I think to always be willing to listen and to try what the school is doing. But I think if not, I, I would I would really recommend trying to reach out to um, one of these national organisations, helplines. Um, and I've only spoken about England. I'm no doubt that um, there are other helplines in in other nations of the UK and indeed internationally. Um, and um, because. There is a danger if you're going to go privately, you can end up in the hands of someone who is um, peddling neuromyths. Thank you very much for joining me today, Maggie, and thank you at home for listening. Maggie's lecture was the first in a series of three lectures under the heading Neurodiversity. Today is the 28th of February, and as we speak, Francesca Happe has would have just finished her lecture on changes in the concept of autism, which will be available to watch on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And on Monday the 11th of March, Peter Hill will round off the series with a lecture on the modern concepts of ADHD. Information about these lectures and the speakers can be found on our website, www.gresham.ac.uk. Maggie, thank you again. Thank you very much. It's been great. (laughs) 